Hi guys, Rio here. Welcome or welcome back to the channel. Uh, this is the humidity hair edition of our show. <laughs> uh, so today's Wednesday, so of course this is the next in my series of film reviews. Uh, I'm a little late to the party on this one, uh, judging by other reactions I'm seeing on YouTube, uh, but I just literally discovered this thing like two days ago and I don't know man, it just it got me, so I need to talk about it. Uh, today we're going to be looking at a film that came out from Lionsgate. By the way, Lionsgate is the independent arm of MGM, so technically speaking, this is an independent film, and I'm going to stand by that assessment. Ladies and gentlemen, today we are talking about Midnight Meat Train. Midnight Meat Train. Is actually, it's based on a story by Clive Barker, so that's kind of already a, a mark in its favor. Uh, any of us who are familiar with a lot of Clark Barker's work, you already know it's going to be freaking weird, right? Um, but it's based on a short story by Clive Barker, uh, with the screenplay actually done by a man named Jeff Bueller, if I'm pronouncing it right, B-U-H-L-E-R, Bueller, um, uh, who was, among other things, was one of the uh, <coughs> screenwriters on the remake of uh, Pet Cemetery, and a bunch of other stuff. This guy's not a newbie. Um, and they put this whole thing together. Um, based on that story, now this is where y'all are going to hate me. You're going to hate me so much right now because I am going to totally butcher this man's name. I'm only going to try it once. And uh, from this point forward, he will be referred to as the director. The director on this film is Ryoi Kitamura. It's the only time I'm going to say it. So our story follows a photographer named Leon. Uh, played by the most awesome Bradley Cooper, right? Yeah. Um, this, you know, he's a photographer specializing in sort of slice of life type photography. Um, he wants to show the real New York, uh, little bits that most people don't really know anything about the actual people that live in the city, the heart of it. Right. Um, it's an admirable goal. What interests you? The city, because no one's ever captured it. Not the way it really is. That's my goal. That's my dream. Of course, his photos don't really go anywhere. He's just desperately trying to, like, sell one to the newspaper or something, right? Like, just anything to kind of get noticed. Um, he does eventually get introduced to an art dealer uh, who looks at a portfolio of his work and is kind of like, yeah, no. <laughs> then you're failing. The next time you find yourself at the heart of the city, stay put. Keep shooting. Um, he ends up actually photographing uh, a woman in a subway who gets attacked. Rather than help her, he, photogra he photographs her. Um, he does ultimately help her, but he spends a whole lot of time taking pictures first. Um, yeah. I wasn't stalking her, but you did continue to photograph. Yeah. Um, as so all this happens, but through the course of that is where our story kind of really gets started. Right? Because what happens is Leon here uh, starts to figure some things out. Uh, he sees this strange man who kind of seems to be everywhere. Um, so he starts following this man to photograph him. And slowly but surely, Leon starts pulling the thread. And the more he pulls this thread, the more obsessed he becomes. And by the time he's gotten to a certain stage of things, he can't turn back even if he wanted to. And uh, you know what they say about curiosity in cats? Mm-hmm. These represent missing people for the last three years. So we know from the beginning of the film, and even from the trailer, honestly, um, we already know from the beginning that there's a killer on the train. Uh, what we don't know is the whys and wherefores. Um, our killer, of course, is called Mahogany. I think you only hear his name spoken once. But he's called Mahogany, and he's played by the most amazing Vinnie Jones, who you guys have probably heard of in a lot of movies. This guy's great. He never speaks a single word of dialogue the whole movie. Um, <clears throat> and he is completely intimidating, um, and it's just that look. He got a million mile stare that's just, <laughs> yikes. It began with a photograph. A single act. You do have, uh, another, ma another ma major player we have, of course, is his girlfriend, Maya, Leon's, Leon's girlfriend, Maya, who is played by Leslie Bibb. Now, you may or may not recognize her name, but she actually did play a character in Iron Man. What happened? I saw it. Take your pictures to the cops. Um, most of the story is basically set on the subways, as you can guess by the title. Uh, the Midnight Meat Train. Midnight Meat Train. 
So we're talking about something that's going on on the subways. Um, it's a nice bit of sort of urban folklore. Um, cause let's face it, anyone, if you've ever lived in New York, I lived in New York for a while. Um, <clears throat> I did a theater internship in New York. I lived in the, uh, I lived in the East Village for a summer with like 15 other people in a single apartment, <laughs> you know, like you do. Um, and that was one of the things you're always told, you know, don't take a subway, don't take a subway at night. Right, it's one of those big warnings you get. Um, well, the story absolutely plays on that, which I think is fantastic. But there's so, there's so many other kind of really colorful side characters. Um, I'm not even sure I caught the names of everybody. Um, they have a best friend. I think it's Jargis is his name. Yeah, Jargis is his name. Uh, played by Roger Bart, who's actually a Tony Award winning actor. Um, so, like, yeah, and there's also a very nice little cameo uh, by our dear Tony Curran from Doctor Who. Um, there's a lot of really, really good players in this. But I'll just go ahead and say this. I hope it won't ruin anything. But uh, watch for the cameo for Ted Raimi. <laughs> yeah. He butchers them like cattle. They never find the remains because he unloads the meat somewhere. All right, so let's talk about special effects, okay? You've got a movie called Midnight Meat Train. Midnight Meat Train. <laughs> I better get some blood and guts and veins in my teeth. I better get some serious gore. If you've ever seen a Clive Barker story, you already know you're going to get, like, viable gore, right? Not a disappointment, man. Um, there are a million names listed under the makeup and special effects. Um, there is a bit of digital that's used in a few points. Um... For the most part, it's a lot of practical. And I can't even begin with the millions of names listed under the makeup department, special effects department, visual effects. There are a million names, literally. Um, but I am going to focus on who I believe is actually the ones I should be talking about. And it's a group called WM Creations. Okay, they are credited with a lot of the special prosthetics. Um, which, there's a lot of that! <laughs> So as far as I can tell, this group is probably the ones primarily responsible for most of the practicals that you see in the movie. And, uh, but like I said, there's a million names listed outside of WM Creations. There's another 15, 20 people listed under makeups and viz. So this was definitely a lot of people and the work shows. Okay. The work shows, uh, some of the most realistic and, uh, <laughs> singularly most disgusting stuff I've seen in a while. And this is coming from a person who does that for a living. So I'm like, oh, right. There's one scene later in the movie. I'm not going to tell you what it is because I don't want to spoil anything. But there's one sequence about halfway through the movie where I was just literally like, Ugh. Mm. like my spine was compressing. It was just so gross. Um, yes. <laughs> the only way to make it stop is to go for the right. One of the things I remember hearing years ago. Uh, was from a quote from Alfred Hitchcock uh, talking about the difference between horror and suspense. <clears throat> um, and if I remember correctly, I'm paraphrasing here, but what I remember him saying was something to the effect of, you know, there's two people at a table having dinner and there's a bomb under the table, right? The audience sees it, the people at the table do not. Horror is the bomb goes off, everybody dies. Suspense is we know it's there, they don't know it's there. And we sit there and bite our nails wondering when they're going to notice, if they're going to notice, what happens when they do notice. That's suspense. This film? Yes. <laughs> that sort of Hitchcockian concept of suspense versus horror. This is a beautiful balance. The story never slows down. Like, not once. Um, it keeps everything heightened. It keeps everything tense. You're the whole time going, dude, mm, no, wait, uh, because we know. For the most part, us as the audience, we know about three quarters of what's actually going on. We still don't know all of it, but we know much more than the characters do. And as we watch Leon, and then ultimately Maya, watch them, and then their friend Jurgis, as we watch all of these characters start to get sucked into the web as they keep pulling the threads and trying to find out what's going on. We're just sitting there going, ooh, oh, dude, dude, just, dude. Right the whole time, that is suspense. Um, and then you get the moments of great horror and gore, and you're like, ah, boom! And it brings you right back to the suspense. Sheer brilliance. 
let's take a minute and talk about the score on this film. Um, some really interesting choices. <clears throat> Again, it's used really well. Sometimes you don't even really notice it. You're so wrapped up in the story, you don't even realize it's going on. Um, and other times, it just soars, but at the right moments. Um, some interesting choices made in the score. Um, specifically, when you get to the end of the movie, there's like a final theme that is just so good. It's this really great sort of combination of like kind of like Western instruments and like Japanese instruments. It's uh, so good, right? Um, so our composer, um, the main composer, it's listed here, is a... Uh, uh, Johan Kabilki? I'm so sorry if I butchered that. Um, it was actually him and somebody else. There was another person listed on the score. Uh, Robbie Williamson. Well, Rob Williamson. Um, these guys did a great job uh, with a score. Uh, it's evocative. It does what it's supposed to do. It's not overused. Strong where it needs to be. Uh, subtle where it needs to be. Um, and some really amazing choices. The final theme, it's worth sitting through the credits for the final theme. The final theme is just one of the most interesting things I've ever heard. Um, so keep that in mind. <clears throat> one of the things I also like to talk about is cinematography. Now, when you're shooting special effects, and this is a very special effects heavy film, you need to know what you're looking at. You need to know what you're shooting, and you need to know how to make it look the absolute best it can look. Um, also to kind of keep whatever vibe that the film is doing in general. Um, you see something like, say, Tank Girl, there's a certain vibe, right? So, the, and the cinematography reflects the vibe. <clears throat> so in this case, um, our cinematographer, Jonathan Sela, man, I hope I'm doing, I'm not butchering these names, I feel like such a monster right now. Um, uh, you would have seen his work on, uh, Deadpool 2. <laughs> he was a cinematographer on Deadpool 2. That kind of tells you what you need to know, right? Because that had to have been a hard film to shoot. Uh, also Max Payne. Um, this guy's got a good amount of credits. Looks like he shot some Taylor Swift stuff, too. Some music videos. Oh, and Doja Cat. Apparently something for Doja Cat. It's kind of hot. Oh, Atomic Blonde. Favorite movie. John Wick. <laughs> okay, this guy was cinematographer on all of those. He's a cinematographer on this one. Jonathan Sela. He was a... He, he did all the camera work on this one. Some really creative stuff, you guys. Um, the vibe is set, like, from the very opening shot. Um, some really interesting choices that are made. And I don't know, not being a cinematographer myself, I don't know how to describe these, but he, he really sets the vibe all the way. And like I said, when you're shooting special effects, you've really got to know how to shoot them and make them work, especially when you're dealing with like a post-viz where they're doing CGI assist. Solid. Absolutely solid. Um, I'm going to shout out to the editor too, I suppose, because whoever edited this thing kind of knew where to cut and where to paste. Um, this thing is, a, is, is technically, on the technical side of things, is an absolute success. Um, honestly, man, if this film had been made for like a hundred bucks somewhere, I would still love it. <laughs> you know, if it hadn't been like, you know, an indie SAG film coming out from Lionsgate. I found this thing on the table at a convention for five bucks, I'd have bought it. And I'd probably still love it. Um, this is, yeah, I really can't say enough good things about every department uh, in this film. Um, everybody brought an A-game. Everybody did. From the actors, to the effects artists, to the post-viz, the editing, the cinematography, the score composers. This was a success. All the way across the board. There's a train to catch. Rating system. So, rating system. Uh, one out of five. I hate to give a perfect score, man, because it always feels like I set the bar too high for anyone else, but I kind of gotta go with like a... I'm gonna say... Uh, four and a half meat tenderizers. Four and a half. Four and a half meat tenderizers. Uh, <laughs> this thing's good. Uh, this thing's really good. If you have not seen it, you really need to check it out. Midnight meat train. Okay, so I guess that's it for this week's, um, you know, again, if you kind of dig this sort of content, right, there's a little subscribe button over here someplace. Uh, you want to go ahead and hit it. You'll get notified when my reviews come up and whatever other weirdness I end up putting up on this channel, because you never know. Um, and, uh, yeah, if you're, if you're a filmmaker, if you're an independent filmmaker, contact me below. I'll be more than happy to take requests. I'll review any film, man. I absolutely will. Um, I absolutely love indie films, and I will absolutely give love to anybody who's actually doing it. 
okay? Because actually filming it is half the work. Um, many of us don't even get that far. So you got something finished? Contact me down below in the comments. Get a hold of me, man. I will totally review your film. So there we go, guys. That's it for this week. I'll see you guys next week with whatever other thing I happen to discover. And uh, see you later.